This week on the Backtable podcast. So the POW trial was looking at patients who had upper tract disease, who had undergone nephrectomy, and depending on the level of their renal dysfunction after their nephrectomy, they either received adjuvant cisplatin-based treatment or carbogem treatment. And the carbogem also improved recurrence-free survival. So when that came through, that carbogem did have some improvement. It was hard for us as medical oncologists not to extrapolate that somewhat to bladder and other urothelial areas. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Backtable podcast, your source for all things urology. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and at backtable.com. Now, a quick word from our sponsor. This discussion is brought to you by Vericite, provider of the Decipher Prostate Genomic Classifier. Decipher Prostate is a test for patients with localized prostate cancer that can help personalize treatment. Every patient and their prostate cancer is unique, and Decipher Prostate can provide meaningful insight into the aggressiveness of each individual's patient's tumor. Because the Decipher score is derived solely from the genomic characteristics of the tumor, it provides information not available through already known clinical and pathologic factors. Decipher high-risk patients generally benefit from earlier or intensified treatment, while Decipher low-risk patients may be ideal candidates for monitoring or less overall treatment. Decipher Prostate is the most validated gene expression test in localized prostate cancer, with level one evidence in national clinical practice guidelines and more than 70 peer-reviewed publications including more than 65,000 patients. Visit verisite.com slash decipher to learn more. Now, back to the show. This is Aditya Bagrodi as your host this week, and I'm very excited to introduce our guests today, Yair Lotan and Suzanne Cole from the UT Southwestern Departments of Urology and Hematology Oncology. Welcome to the show, Yair and Suzanne. How are you all doing today? Awesome. Thanks for having us. Great. Look forward to it. So in addition to being world-renowned experts, in bladder cancer. Yair and Suzanne are both close to your friends and uh, bring some interesting perspectives. Suzanne spent uh, her first part of her career in private practice and then transitioned to the academic side of things. Yair has been on the academic side for the entirety of his career and has really done some of the kind of landmark work in biomarkers, predictive biomarkers, and you know, really looking forward to your input on adjuvant therapy for bladder cancer. So as I was kind of preparing for this talk, I think it's hard to have a conversation about adjuvant therapy for bladder cancer without talking a little bit about neoadjuvant chemotherapy for bladder cancer. So maybe just first and foremost, newly diagnosed muscle invasive bladder cancer imaging without any evidence of metastases. Are you generally fairly pro neoadjuvant chemotherapy? What are some of the barriers that you all encounter? I think it's important to discuss it with all patients. At the end of the day, there are very few things that improve survival with good level one evidence. And new adjuvant chemotherapy has level one evidence that it will improve survival. I think a lot of people are, are somewhat hesitant about the 5-10% absolute advantage and think that that may be a pretty significant cost from the potential toxicity of chemotherapy. But if you look at it from the perspective of reduced likelihood of dying, which is closer to 20%, I think that is quite impactful for patients, especially if you look at a large number of patients who have a good survival, at least a good life expectancy. Uh, I don't think I would recommend it necessarily for patients who are in their early to mid 80s, but some of them actually have quite good performance status and, and deserve a conversation. The other issue is that, at least at our institution, we have a variety of trials. It's important to be able to advance the field, and even if they're platinum ineligible, there are good trials. So it's great. I'll talk to them about it. If they don't just immediately say no, I recommend they at least have a discussion with a medical oncologist. Usually I have to do restaging, and even if we're going to end up scheduling a cystectomy, the conversation, I think, to them at least will confirm to them that they're making the right decision, even if they decide at the end of the day not to pursue it. Okay, you mentioned cisplatinum ineligible. Suzanne, when you're in taking a patient, what are some of the key factors that are going to preclude somebody from receiving platinum? So, you know, I'm, I'm pretty aggressive with treating my patients. And if people are able to walk into my office, I really try hard to see if we can get them to, to be able to receive cisplatin. You know, some patients are going to have really poor renal function, but sometimes that's because of hydronephrosis and 
putting percutaneous nephrostomy tubes in place are really important. You know, fixing the things that we can fix are important. I recently gave a talk about the use of cisplatin in metastatic disease. And, you know, for patients, particularly if you have a chance to cure them, traditionally in the past, there's been concerns about if somebody has, you know, some hearing loss or some history of neuropathy, that those are reasons that they could not go forward with receiving cisplatin. But in the neoadjuvant setting, you're only doing three or four cycles of chemotherapy. You may get some of those toxicities that may enhance. But, you know, if you ask patients, would you rather be alive with some hearing loss and hearing aids, or would you rather be alive with some neuropathy? Most of them say yes, because they really are motivated to stay alive. And, you know, to your point, the idea of improving survival is really important, and cisplatin is kind of the backbone of that. For my patients, you know, almost anybody who has a reasonable performance status, I've been able to get them through it. And I think some of it is the tricks of how you treat them, splitting the cisplatin dose. When people come back for their second cycle, if their creatinine is bumped, you may have to hold or skip that cycle. But I'm usually able to get two, three, sometimes four doses in, and my patients go to surgery and they do pretty well. Okay, so hearing loss, peripheral neuropathy, that's kind of a conversation. Creatinine clearance as you get in that 40 to 60 range, now you're going to kind of rely on some some of the tips and tricks you mentioned, split dose, splitting doses, for instance. And um, are you getting echoes on everybody before administering chemo? Yeah, so I do MVAC almost exclusively because I find it to be an easier regimen. You get to give growth factor with it, which you're not able to do with Gemsys. And I, I just find it's faster. It's eight weeks instead of 12 weeks with the Gemsys. So everybody who gets MVAC has the adromycin component, and you have to have an echocardiogram. You also have to have a metaport. So both of those things are hurdles we have to get through to get the chemo set up. But once it's rolling, I love the fact that it's every two weeks. It's very tolerable to patients. And if you have them coming back with toxicity for their second or third cycle, it's really easy to skip it. And they have that little extra time to recover. And by the time they come in for their next dose, they're ready to go. And since the POUT trial came out several years ago, where they were using cisplatin on patients who had already had nephrectomies in the upper tract setting, they required patients who had a creatinine clearance of greater than 50 to receive cisplatin. It was required in the protocol. And when I saw that, it kind of really reinforced to me that we could go lower than the 60. And, you know, so that became my standard of care at that point. And I have on occasion, you know, dipped into the 40s, depending on the patient and and how they're tolerating. But when you split cisplatin, I usually do it day one, day two. And if somebody comes in and their creatinine is not very great, I'll give them the three other drugs with fluids. And then on the second day, I'll skip the cisplatin on the first day. And on the second day, if their creatinine has improved to safe threshold, then I'll give them that second half. And so sometimes they're getting half doses during the treatments, and and that's all been helpful. Okay. There may be some patient preference things that Yair alluded to where patients just say, you know, I had an aunt, they went through chemo, I'm not doing that. Or, you know, maybe clinically they seemed somewhat on the favorable muscle invasive end of the spectrum with a solitary tumor completely resected. Or maybe they're truly platinum ineligible. And in that case, I think what I'm hearing is the preferred strategy would be a clinical trial. Is that uh, is that accurate? For us, for sure. Yeah, does that does that resonate in terms of muscle invasive bladder cancer, refusing cystectomy, ineligible for platinum based chemotherapy? Now we're going to move forward with surgery. Yes, but I mean, I I don't want to get in trouble. I mean, we do discuss chemo radiation protocols. I also think that at this time it's a little dangerous to consider somebody a favorable muscle invasive versus an unfavorable. I'm very hopeful that we can get some biomarkers, whether or not subtyping or other ones to sort of identify that. But micrometastatic disease is not necessarily going to be determined by whether or not you had a solitary tumor in your bladder. We really can't assess that. And we know we understage about 40% of patients. So We'd like to think that a good TUR will get you to PT0, and that happens about 15% of the time. You can do a very good TUR, and if the patient's already got disease in their nodes or somewhere else, it didn't change their prognosis, right? So I still would have a discussion no matter what the TUR was like. I feel better about it if I could resect all disease. It certainly would make me a little bit more positive regarding chemoradiation protocols, but maybe that's another advantage of neoadjuvant chemotherapy is you can push the decision on what type of local therapy down the road a little bit. Some patients are hesitant about cystectomy. They're not really sure what they want to do. And if you can convince them to get neoadjuvant chemotherapy, then that decision might be a little easier in two to three months. 
maybe I just, for the sake of completeness, that hopefully the patients have met with the critical players, multidisciplinary clinics, and made the decision that surgery with or, with, with or without perioperative chemotherapy is the route that they want to go. And perhaps it would have been better to state that if, as long if they're eligible and they didn't have maybe super adverse risk factors, hydronephrosis, evidence of extravascular disease on their imaging, uh, equivocal or enlarged nodes, there's some debate there that they say, okay, you really don't want it, you're a candidate, but let's push on with surgery. Yeah. I mean, obviously, even at our institution, I think about half the patients end up new ad- getting new adjuvant chemotherapy and the other half go straight to surgery. So there's a variety of reasons why this happens. A large part is patient preference and some of it is biology driven, some of it's uh, patient driven. So I don't think that's wrong. And But I think my job as a clinician is to present all the options and, and the pros and cons for the approaches. And then the patient's going to have to make a decision that they think is best suited. And like I said, I have my preference, which is to try to get the new adjuvant therapies. And if, if they decide to move to surgery, then obviously we're going to discuss all the potential adjuvant options that will come down the road. So if they need systemic therapy, there's still going to be a chance to do it. Yeah. So as we're all aware here, the uh, post-operative course for cystectomy patients can be highly varied. I think widely quoted numbers from large surgical series at a memorial in Vanderbilt would indicate that almost two out of three patients are going to have some type of complication. Does that factor into your conversation at all, that there could be something that transpires after surgery that would actually preclude you from getting, quote unquote, adjuvant therapy? I mean, I, I, I have extensive discussions about the potential complications. This is more of a discussion for upper tract disease where I think there's quite well documented that if you take out a kidney, the likelihood of being able to get platinum therapy diminishes dramatically. I don't quite have the discussion of, well, you better get neoadjuvant because you might not be able to get adjuvant because I really feel like within three months, most of the patients are likely going to recover enough to be able to get adjuvant therapies. They may not be able to get it in the first four to six weeks, and nor do I have high expectation that they would. But there are some patients that are going to fail to thrive, et cetera, and, and they're not going to be able to get adjuvant therapies. But the vast majority within, within 90 days should be able to start an adjuvant regimen if they need it. Now, I mean, we'll talk about it later. Maybe maybe they'll go with the checkpoint inhibitor rather than platinum if they really are having a lot of issues. But a lot of patients can tolerate immune therapies better than they can tolerate chemotherapy. So there will be some potential sacrifice, but unfortunately, I really don't think that I could have that kind of discussion, talk about new adjuvant therapies, talk about cystectomy, talk about chemoradiation, talk about different diversions. And by the way, let's talk about adjuvant therapies just in case. So I'm not sure patients wouldn't be overwhelmed. I might be overwhelmed myself. Yeah, I think it's an excellent point. And you know, for me, ideally, you could start adjuvant therapy within about six to eight months hopefully within three months, as you kind of mentioned. And what I typically do if they're high risk, and we'll we'll kind of talk about what that means, is just restage them a little bit early just to make sure even over the interval of their convalescence, especially if it's protracted, that something didn't didn't pop up. But usually I'll I'll consider that salvage therapy. I mean, by then you have imaging and you're, I mean, if it's a patient with you know, with a higher risk disease, I'm going to get imaging at three months and look for an early sign of, of disease if they didn't get adjuvant therapy so they could get early salvage. I kind of try to consider first three to four months is usually the criteria for adjuvant trials. And I try to stick to that sort of in my, at least in my thought process of what represents adjuvant versus not. If somebody was disease free at six months, I'm not sure I'd give them adjuvant. I think I might just wait to see if they ever recurred because bladder cancer is so aggressive, most events will happen pretty early. Okay. I have a question for you guys. Since you're on the urology side and you deal with all of the post-op complications, what do you think is the sweet spot for when we should be starting chemo? Because I am never starting anyone at six weeks post-op. I'm not even meeting with them until eight weeks after they've had their surgery to even talk about it because they're still healing. And if I start talking to them about chemotherapy, they're like, no, no way. I'm not doing it. You know what I mean? And so like, Most of my patients are starting somewhere between 12 and 16 weeks after surgery. And I'm just curious, like, what are you seeing? Yeah, I think it's a fair point. And I think there's some philosophically different approaches in terms of overwhelming patients and appropriately warning them that there may be more coming. You know, I deal with a lot of patients that have testicular cancer and I'll meet them at the time of presentation when they have metastases, not to run through all the nitty gritty of an RPL and D, but just to gently introduce the concept that Say, for instance, after chemotherapy, they may need surgery to remove nodes. And then 
after chemotherapy, two, four weeks have lapsed, and now we're having a little bit more of a detailed discussion. But I do think hearing it at multiple time points may be valuable. By all means, I would imagine Yair would have talked to the patient about, hey, you've got high-risk features, and you know we may have more coming, just so it doesn't come out of the blue that I've kind of been through the ringer. I thought I was done, and now now there's more coming with or without a possible benefit. Just to chime in, you know, I'm going to see the patient two weeks after cystectomy, take out their stents, their staples, and go over pathology. And I know at that time whether or not I'm going to be referring them. So I usually will have a conversation, obviously, if T3B, T4, node positive, invasive disease, post-neoadjuvant chemo, they already have an oncologist. So they're, they probably already have follow-up with, a, with oncology to go over a path and see whether or not there's any role. But I'm definitely going to tell them, look, it's way too soon to start considering the systemic therapy, but you're going to need systemic therapy. So I almost tell them, that's my expectation for you, is that you're going to see an oncologist and need systemic therapy. So there's no rush. We want to give you a good six to eight weeks, but I'm not going to meet them at three months and say, by the way, I, you need systemic therapy. I'm going to tell them at two weeks when I go over the pathology report, what the implications are. And I'm just going to tell them, look, best case scenario is we get you better in the next couple of months and send you to an oncologist. I'll reassure them that we don't need to rush to do it because hopefully we didn't leave gross evidence of disease behind. That's a whole different type of conversation. But most of the time you'll have microscopic nodal disease or you'll have T3B disease, usually with negative margins or T4A with negative margins. And you say, look, you have a high likelihood of also having systemic disease. And so they will know, and I will usually see them again, but I will also refer them to oncology. It's just, it won't be an urgent referral for sure. And, and when you're counseling them at that first post-operative visit, discussing pathology, are you using nomograms or broad buckets here, T3 to node positive? They've got a, what, 30, 50% chance of being cured by surgery alone. How does that kind of conversation and counseling go? And and maybe for my own curiosity, I, I find it to be more and more challenging these days where people are expecting my chart results with their path released to them in five to seven days after their surgery. And are you calling them and kind of prefacing them or walk me through a little bit of the nitty gritty of that? Yeah, they're, they are getting the reports and sometimes they all have my cell phone. So sometimes they'll call me and ask, but most of the time they'll wait till their visit. They've just been in the hospital for six days. They've kind of seen enough of me for a little while. So they get a week off and then we'll go over the pathology report. But I think the conversation generally is, I don't need a a nomogram to know who is at higher risk. Obviously, you know, uh, if there's lymphovascular invasion, that makes me a little bit more concerned and kind of know what the criteria are for adjuvant trials. So, you know, the T3Bs, the T4s, and the bare positive margin and the positive notes, uh, those are the ones. Now, if you're T3A, very high volume, maybe, but I'm not, you know, as concerned about you. The ones that sort of are a little bit more problematic are the T2s, negative nodes, negative margins, but post chemo. So they have small amount of residual invasive disease, but overall they don't have much, but I think they're certainly reasonable evidence they might benefit from a checkpoint inhibitor. So I at least want them to have that conversation, but I won't, I'm not as quite as concerned as a patient with node positive disease, you know, so, but I don't, I don't, I've been involved with several nomograms, but the, it's usually an eyeball test rather of the path report rather than some sort of mathematical calculation of, are you at 54% risk of recurrence or, you know, 62%, that doesn't matter. Yeah, I mean, I think also in the era of shared decision making, it's it's exactly that. You know, some people a thirty percent risk of recurrence may be unacceptably high, and some people may say, "Great, I've got a two out of three chance of being cured." Okay, how about variant histology? Is that kind of factoring into this at all? It is more on the TRBT side, right? Because you know, bad variants. Obviously, we the the neuroendocrines. You know, they're going to get chemo. That's kind of a no brainer. I'm not taking them to cystectomy without chemo, no matter what they say. I mean, a high volume of micropapillary might be more inclined not to even consider intravescal therapies if they're even without muscle invasion. They don't get they don't get neoadjuvant therapies, but other variants, as long as they're urothelial, primarily urothelial, I will refer them to talk about neoadjuvant chemotherapy. There's some it's a little controversial to me. There's some people that sort of say, well, plasma cytoid, maybe they don't do well with chemo, but they don't do well with anything. So 
I don't feel like rushing them to surgery is going to save their life either, unfortunately, but I at least want them to have some discussion about it, even if at the end of the day, it's not clear what the benefit is for surgery alone or, or neoadjuvant chemo followed by surgery. Yeah, and I agree with that. The variants are kind of all over the place. Aditya, you and I had a patient like five years ago that had plasma cytoid, and he got MVAC, and he grew through it. He had a, a liver metastasis. I don't know if you remember this guy. So we pivoted away from surgery, obviously, and he went on a checkpoint, and he went into a complete remission. And he's still walking around with plasma cytoid, you know, and he's like my N of one who's still living, whereas, you know, almost every other plasma cytoid, even if they respond to chemo or something else, like usually within a year, they're gone because it just comes raging back. I like with some of these, you know, really horrible diseases like the neuroendocrines or the plasma cytoids to give them some time with the chemotherapy because sometimes they'll declare themselves and you've spared them, you know, kind of horrific surgery that you you don't put them through right before they die, right? So that's kind of my take on the variants. The other thing, I'm curious kind of what your experience is. You know, historically, it's been taught to us that squamous cell is not going to respond to chemotherapy and that those patients should just go to surgery. But most of the squamous cell that I see has urothelial components to it. And so if they come to me and they ha- if they're not a pure squamous bladder tumor and they have a urothelial carcinoma component, I will give them neoadjuvant. And I'm, I'm really like impressed by how many of them do respond to the chemotherapy and the squamous kind of melts away. And sometimes what's left or when they have their cystectomy, the component that's still there is the urothelial part. So I, I'm kind of wondering, like, where did this squamous doesn't respond to chemotherapy come from? Yeah, I, th- I mean, I think the variants are intriguing. And the more we look for them and probably with molecular testing, they're going to become more and more commonplace. It, it would be easy to deviate into a conversation about variants completely. But maybe just to kind of provide some framework for talking about this, we could first focus on the chemo-naive patients. I think Yair's nicely outlined the kind of higher-risk patients that certainly merit a conversation with a medical oncologist. And Suzanne, at this point, you know, maybe just kind of talk us through your counseling, your spiel, if you will, for a new patient with high-risk features. What do the next several weeks and months look like as they receive either MVAC, which is your preferred regimen, of course, um, gem cis is another regimen that's commonly used, but talk, just kind of walk us through a little bit on, you know, what to tell the patients. So to be fair, most of my patients that actually receive adjuvant chemotherapy, they're receiving a carbo-based regimen because they were truly cisplatin ineligible. And so they're they're going with like a carbo gem kind of regimen. And those patients who receive chemotherapy, they're more fit. They've recovered from their operation. They don't have a lot of comorbidities. And those are the ones that I'm choosing to move forward with chemotherapy. The patients who, for some reason, didn't get a chance to have neoadjuvant or declined it, usually if they declined it, they don't agree to do it after the fact. Very few people are like, oh, I've changed my mind. I'm ready to do it now. You know, the same reasons that prevented them from wanting to do cisplatin-based chemotherapy in, in the beginning, you know, kind of hold, hold true. Some people might be swayed by the horrifying pathology, but they're much more interested in the immunotherapy because it's just a lot more, you know, sexy these days. It's on, it's on commercials everywhere. You know, people know what Keytruda is and Optivo. And, and there's a general feeling in the population that immunotherapy is easy and very safe and a lot more of a walk in the park than, than systemic chemotherapy. So... In general, if they're cisplatin eligible and they're continuing to refuse cisplatin, you would go with gem carbo as opposed to adjuvant nevo? So if they are cisplatin eligible and they're refusing it, I tend to offer immunotherapy Okay. as an alternative. I tend to just like, I'm not going to fight with you about chemo or no chemo. I just go forward with offering them the immunotherapy and most of them will take me up on that. And then, you know, if somebody comes to me and they just weren't offered it, or maybe they had really poor renal function, but then when the bladder came out and they weren't obstructed anymore and their renal function improved and now they're eligible for chemotherapy, then we go with the cisplatin-based regimen. So that that works out for some people. And that's going to be four cycles? 
So if it's MVAC, I try for four. I would say like 80% of my patients get through at least three cycles, and I'm really happy with that. So three is like good enough for me. Four is kind of icing on, on the cake if I can get people through four. But a lot of that just has to do with their age, organ function, you know, stamina, and also how well they've bounced back from their operation. Okay. One of the things that I think is exciting is some of the early indicators of recurrence, such as cell-free DNA. Is that something that you all are incorporating into your workflow, or do you believe it, the, the value in it? We have one urologist who is sending it on everyone, and so it's just information that we have to absorb. You know, it's there. And, you know, I don't always know what to do with it because sometimes, you know, a patient has made like a firm decision and then you have this positive cell-free DNA and you just know they're not going to do well or you're worried they're not going to do well, but you're hoping maybe their immune system will clean it up because they've declined treatment. But it's, I don't know, it's just like it's a lot of doubt in my mind right now of how to use this and how to use it well and how to act on it or not act on it. But every time I see a positive, I just want to treat them. Yeah, maybe provide a little bit of the backdrop. There's, I guess it's a couple of years out, there was a Tom Powell's paper in Nature where they did a correlative analysis of cell-free DNA and the um, ability to predict outcomes. And maybe I'll just take a stab at it. You know, I think the Cliff's notes were that in patients that were cell-free DNA negative after surgery, we didn't really see much of a benefit in adjuvant immunotherapy and for those patients that were positive for a cell-free DNA after surgery, we saw a fairly wide split of the curves. So in fairness, we're, we're setting up a protocol now to do it, and we're actually going to start a clinical trial. So Natera has, you know, the commercially available product Signatera, and we're doing a trial with C2I Genomics that has a, a, a different mechanism, but also looking at minimal residual disease. I think the perhaps the confusion right now is that for the approved agent nivolumab, there was no, there was a positive trial without needing the marker. The Atizo trial was the negative trial that was subsequently reanalyzed and showed that those patients who were positive for circulating DNA uh, could have benefited. So if you had a patient right now that you clinically think should get the therapy, the test can only confuse you because if it's negative, but you clinically think the patient should get the benefit and the trial showed a benefit to those patients without a marker, you might dissuade a patient who might benefit from getting the drug. And don't forget that nothing is clean cut. There were false negatives and false positives. So I think in a patient where you're borderline and you would like them to get it, but they're kind of hesitant, it might push them to get it. On the other hand, if you have a patient who is willing to get it and has all the clinical criteria and there's an approved agent, it might dissuade you from giving a drug that they could theoretically still benefit from. So I think we're still in the early days. Yes, we all want personalized medicine. It makes perfect sense that if you have circulating DNA two to three weeks after your bladder was removed, something might be going on. It might even be likely that something would be going on, but but the negative is not necessarily re completely reassuring. So, you know, I would love to see how well this works in patients who are clinical T2 or T3A, where you wouldn't normally give it, but we know that about 25 to 30% of them will recur. If a patient's node positive, I never want them not to get it because they're 70% likely to recur. And I would have to have, you know, a false negative result that, you know, six months later they show up and you say, boy, I wonder if I could have done better. So I think it's important to keep a close eye on these biomarkers. Sure, here at academic centers, we can set up prospective protocols and we can do studies. But I think it may be the important thing to know is that we have approved agents with a benefit that are, you know, for those high-risk patients. And so I don't know that you need to just look at a marker to make that decision right now. In the future, maybe, though, we can enrich for patients who are most likely to need it, whether or not they have all the high-risk features or maybe just some of them. Yeah, I think it's certainly the early days. I've definitely had some patients that early post-op had a negative signatura test and then fast forward three months they quote unquote sero converted a positive and i think there's just a kind of a lot of emotion that goes along with that at the patient side thinking they were quote unquote cured and then maybe have some different info coming their way 
you picked a couple of extremes there. So a T2, T3A, 70% likelihood of cure, node positive, 30% likelihood of cure. Then you have your T3Bs that are a coin flip. And I always find some of the most challenging conversations to be adjuvant therapy conversations. Because for that patient, there's about a 50% chance that something's going to be done to you, which is going to be rough, typically chemotherapy or immunotherapy. And despite the fact that it's well tolerated, in quotes, you know, the risk of serious colitis and death is not trivial. And to say, all right, let's put you through something, but there's a 50% chance that you were cured with surgery alone and we're not going to help you. So it's exciting to kind of start to see those signals that can hopefully take some of this trial quasi population level data and, and apply it to an individual. But I would say we've started incorporating it. It isn't the alpha and the omega, but it is factored. And, you know, we'll talk about upper tract here in a little bit. I swear I've had a slew of patients with concomitantly diagnosed upper tract and lower tract disease. And it's not clear cut if they have a bladder recurrence or, you know, systemic recurrence from their upper tract disease. And we've had a positive signatura. Do you need BCG or do you need chemotherapy? And those are obviously fairly different clinical scenarios. Just to comment on that, they probably need systemic therapy, right? We, we know that these markers have mostly been tested on patients with systemic disease and probably don't do as well for stage one or CIS who don't have, a, you hope that your CIS patients don't have too much circulating DNA going around. Fair. Okay, so I think what I'm hearing is in chemotherapy-naive, cisplatin-eligible patients, ideally, if they're amenable, it's a cisplatin-based regimen. If they're ineligible or refusing, the preferred option is Nevo. And then the third option in cisplatin-ineligible would be something like Jim Carbo. Correct. So I always get particularly worried in the post-chemo patients with persistent invasive disease, and especially if they had node positive disease. How do you kind of think about that year? How does that conversation go when you see them in the clinic and they've got something brewing? Well, obviously it's very disappointing, you know, in the sense that they still have persistent significant disease. Now, I'd comment on the challenge is that not every node positive disease is the same. So one out of 20 nodes, microscopic, I can tell them, look, I'm concerned, but you're probably at the higher end of the likelihood of cure. And it doesn't mean the chemo didn't work. You may have had four or five positive nodes, and now you have a small amount of microscopic disease. And those patients, I'm still going to recommend adjuvant therapy, but they're on, they're on one edge of the spectrum in terms of what a node positive patient is. I mean, a patient who I, I'm going to the OR and I open up and there's all this palpable disease, that's a completely different patient. And that's a patient that now I'm thinking, okay, they're going to probably, I'm going to probably even talk about adjuvant radiation. They're, they're definitely in trouble and there's no way to sugarcoat that. And, you know, I don't even do neobladders on those patients. I think that they, their survival likelihood, you know, is too short to justify. And I even tell my patients, and I, I know Dr. Donishman at USC probably would frown on that, but I just tell them, if I see palpable nodes, I'm just doing a conduit. I want you to recover as soon as possible because you're going to need a bunch of stuff. So those are the other end of the spectrum. But uh, I think, you know, at the end of the day, the conversation for all those patients is you're going to need some adjuvant therapy and we have to, you know, you didn't have a complete response, which is what we were really hoping for if you had already gotten chemotherapy. And that just means that we're going to have to be more aggressive in, in the adjuvant setting. Yeah. You know, really, it sounds like the extended post-chemo criteria is the inclusion of T2 disease that, that certainly merits a discussion. Question for you, I would say that historically, if patients had clinically involved pelvic lymph nodes, many times we would try to get four cycles of chemo and restage if there's involution of the node, get an additional two cycles, and then move on with surgery. Is that still the philosophy or now with a adjuvant option like Nevo, you get your four cycles in, do your operation, and then if their high risk path, consider some adjuvant Nevo? So I think that that really changed probably about seven or eight years ago. There were two papers that came out in the medical oncology literature for neoadjuvant chemotherapy where four cycles of MVAC and three cycles of MVAC had equivalent survivals and also pathologic response rates. So the six-cycle idea kind of 
shifted towards four. And that that happened while I was in practice. But when I was in fellowship, six was pretty standard. It's really, really tough to get people through six cycles. You beat them up quite significantly. And, and then to go straight into a cystectomy is pretty tough. I can't recall doing six cycles in probably about 12 years, 10 years, something like that. I do think it's important, uh, Aditya, that that the urologist have a conversation with a medical oncologist prior to new adjuvant chemotherapy. I personally give my cell phone to all these patients because many of them live far away from us. And I tell them, go find your, you know, if you can't come to Dallas, you know, I need to talk to your medical oncologist before they start you. And a fair number still want to give six cycles of, of therapy. And I always talk to the medical oncologist and say, no, don't do that. Let's give three or four, depending on how the patient tolerates. Ideally, I can talk them into dose dense MVAC, but sometimes they're just going to give gem cysts because that's what they always do. But many of them are pushing for that those six cycles. And it, you know, maybe they're, this is an older generation, but you really don't want them getting six cycles. First of all, it's going to delay the cystectomy. There's no clear benefit. And so it's good enough for them to get, I think, three or four cycles, recover for four to six weeks and get their cystectomy. But communication is key for almost all, for all multidisciplinary care, especially if it's not done all at your institution. Yeah, I think I appreciate that insight. You know, interestingly enough, as you both are aware, there's also been relatively recent studies of six cycles of gem cysts, I think led out of some Kettering that showed reasonable safety, tolerability, and maybe some improved efficacy. So, you know, maybe, who knows, one day, perhaps with these markers of mineral residual disease, we can tailor things, you know, three cycles, four cycles, six cycles, who's likely to derive further benefit. So we're not just putting them through those rough cycles that I think cumulatively get worse without any benefit. Yair, you mentioned adjuvant radiation. And I think a lot of our understanding and data of adjuvant radiation comes from our colleagues in Egypt, but um, you kind of mentioned palpable nodes. Who are the patients that you might be considering for adjuvant radiation? Right. I mean, I, they're actually pretty uncommon, to be honest with you. Palpable nodes and positive margins would be the main main characteristics. But T3 ureteral disease is also, to me, a scary thing. I know we're mostly focusing on bladder, but if you have a patient with T3 ureteral disease, I'm not sure where your margin is because you're basically, you're in the fat and you have to assume that, that you might have a positive margin, even if the pathologist is very generous to you because it's a thin tube and if it's growing through the muscle and into that, you know, that thin advent tissue around the ureter, that's a patient I'm quite concerned about. And the recurrence in the retroperitoneum is, can be nightmarish. Now telling the radiation oncologist where to radiate rather than the entire retroperitoneum, it's good if you have some idea, you know, if there was a imaging, a lot of those patients will have imaging and will show you a discrete mass somewhere blocking the kidney. And so they at least have a target zone, even if they're, you already did it enough for you on the patient. But uh, those are really kind of the limited cases. Uh, obviously, if a patient has a local pelvic recurrence, that's a different story. But, but just immediately post-cystectomy, there are very few patients that I recommend uh, uh, radiation for. Yeah. I mean, some of the things that I'll try to do if I'm really worried about gross extravesical disease is actually put a few metallic clips down or if they had node positive disease, put some metallic clips down at least to give some type of fiducial for our radiation oncology colleagues. Right, and you're absolutely right. Local recurrences in the pelvis, thankfully they're quite rare. Soft tissue recurrences, not nodal recurrences, but when they do happen or when you have a positive margin, that's clearly a, a mega risk factor. What about locally advanced pure squamous? Are those patients that you're a little bit more inclined to w towards adjuvant radiation? From a standpoint, these are rare tumors, and unfortunately, I've had the experience of doing simple cystectomies on patients, and then only subsequently finding out that the path was on spinal cord patients who are getting diversions, who you know have been having more and more bladder issues. Nobody really suspected it, or maybe they had some biopsies, and and the biopsies were negative. But it comes back the pathology: you got T3 squamous cell, and maybe you didn't even remove all of it. Sometimes it things are pretty fixed. Well, those are definitely patients that are going to get radiation. Interestingly, they do tend to respond relatively well. And maybe to go back to Suzanne's comment, you know, people do chemo radiation protocols for head, neck, squamous, and other squamous tumors around the body. And we just, the good news is we don't have that many in, in the U.S. So there really haven't been good trials 
looking at that, but certainly for other sites of disease, chemo radiation works quite well. And as a salvage therapy, that's definitely the way to go. Usually going back in surgically is really not a good option. Yeah, that comes up sometimes at our tumor boards and there's a mass fixed to the hypogastric and they're like, well, can you go back in and cut it out? I was like, well, nearly certainly I would have done that the first time, but yeah, those are, those are tough or to try to peel it off the rectum. I, I think there's a, if I'm not mistaken, a adjuvant radiotherapy trial out of Tata Memorial looking at primarily urothelial carcinoma led by Vedang Murthy. So we may have some kind of updated contemporary non bilharzile data to, to guide us which I think is actually kind of exciting. All right, so we've talked about adjuvant chemotherapy, adjuvant immunotherapy. I don't know if suboptimal is the right word, but carbo-based regimens, which are going to be a third option, then radiation. And and clearly a concept that's a, that is obvious, but I think worth mentioning is that these are tricky individualized decisions to be made in conjunction with the multidisciplinary team and certainly with the patient. And, and maybe there's cause to be optimistic as new biomarkers um, kind of come through, not just for minimal residual disease, but also for the likelihood of responding to platinum-based chemotherapy. Interestingly enough, in my opinion, some of the most robust data that exists is in our rare cousin of bladder cancer, upper tract disease. And um, Suzanne, you had mentioned the, the PALT trial. Can you kind of walk us through kind of broad strokes, what that trial looked like and how that influences your practice? So the POW trial was looking at patients who had upper tract disease, who had undergone nephrectomy, and depending on the level of their renal dysfunction after their nephrectomy, they either received adjuvant cisplatin-based treatment or carbogem treatment. And the, the carbogem also improved recurrence-free survival. So when that came through that Carbogem did have some improvement, it was hard for us as medical oncologists not to extrapolate that somewhat to bladder and other urothelial areas. And because so many of our patients have renal dysfunction and just are not candidates for cisplatin, that has kind of opened the door for us to consider it as an option. And I definitely became more liberal with using it outside of the upper tract. We use it often in upper tract whether it's ureter or in the kidney, but that that's kind of the gist of it. Yeah, I think it's kind of interesting how the uptake of adjuvant therapy for upper tract was way more profound than the uptake for adjuvant chemotherapy for, for lower tract bladder ureter carcinoma, despite the fact that the EORTC trial led by Cora Sternberg, I believe, was fairly similar. Yeah, do you have any opinion on that? I think a lot of people have been concerned with lack of level one evidence. I think post nephru patient, especially in the robotic era, feels better than a post cystectomy patient. So, I mean, the whole concept of being strictly adjuvant in the first three or four months, you know, leaves a very short window. You know, as Suzanne says, she didn't really want to talk to these patients until about ten to twelve weeks, or they or they they will refuse her. So. No, I'll talk to them. I'll talk to them at eight weeks. But if I talk to them any earlier, they are like, get out of my life. Like, I am not, I don't ever want to see you again. You know, they're just, they're just not, yeah. they're against it. Yeah, the robotic nephrotomy for you patient feels well within two to three weeks, typically, unless you have some major complication. You don't do all that bowel work. And that bowel work really, usually the only thing a patient post cystectomy thanks me is that they couldn't ever lose those 15 to 20 pounds. And it turns out you can lose 15 to 20 pounds when I do a cystectomy and you pretty routinely. Uh, so it's a whole different population in terms of acceptance of additional therapy and tolerance of those therapies. You know, it's no joke that even with robotic cystectomies, the complication rates are not that different in terms of how quickly you recover. Maybe a couple of days within a couple of days of less than the hospital in the first, you know, three months, if you look at that randomized trial that Dr. Cato published. But it's not like they feel great and they're just ready to get those adjuvant therapies. So I think that's par partially driven it. And it also partially driven my recommendation for new adjuvant therapy because I know it's going to be tough to give them the adjuvant therapy. And it's a lot easier to convince them to have surgery four to six weeks after chemo than chemo eight to 12 weeks after surgery. So you just have to kind of be realistic about your expectations about these. 
The lack of level one evidence though, is surprising, you know, that we still haven't been able to get a well-powered bladder trial. I think there's definitely interest. I'm sure there'd be people with different ideas about what that design should look like. But right now, the PALT trial showed level one evidence for adjuvant therapy. And, and I think especially the T3 patients, they're going to, they're not going to do well in many cases and they should get adjuvant therapy. Yeah. I think that space is also going to get progressively more interesting as there's been a couple of phase two studies, one led by Vitaly Margulis, one by Jonathan Coleman recently with neoadjuvant chemotherapy for upper tract. So uh, nice to see some progress being made in a rare disease, and it really shows the value of, of collaborating. I think we've got a good understanding of the various tools that are in our armamentarium as it kind of stands today. I'm curious, what, what kind of gets you excited? What are going to be the disruptive medications, classes of drugs, combination therapies, MRD markers that you think are going to really shape the next coming years of, of bladder cancer particularly as it pertains to adjuvant therapy? So we have a trial open right now that's looking at adjuvant cisplatin-eligible patients getting GEMSYS versus EV Pembro, and that's been uh, pretty interesting. In, in the metastatic setting, the EV Pembro, I think it's going to read out at ASCO this year, but we enrolled a lot of patients to that trial, and you know when people respond to that, it's pretty amazing and dramatic. And so you know, see, seeing how that shakes out in the earlier stages, like, are we going to be able to, like, really boost the numbers of cured patients with some of these novel agents? On the biomarker front, I'm not, you know, MRD is just one component of it. But, you know, if we can find markers of response, I think that's going to be critical. As much as platinum is effective, it, it also has toxicity. If we can figure out who is most likely to benefit from it, I think that's going to help our patients and help us because if we think you're going to have a high likelihood of response, you might be more willing to accept the toxicity. If we think we have a poor likelihood of response, then we'll all just say, okay, we're going to either go to checkpoint inhibitor or combination or go straight to local therapy. So I'm very hopeful. I mean, the Coxin trial came back. It, it didn't give us all the insight we were hoping for, but maybe there'll be some other markers of disease that, that will predict response. We still don't have great predictors of response for immune therapies. The pd one antibodies and didn't give us enough light. TMB may be interesting among the various things, but there's a lot of research being done on molecular markers at various institutions. And and by various uh, marker companies. So hopefully we will be able to get to a point where we will be able to offer personalized medicine. We, we, we talk about that, but you know, there's a moonshot project now, there's money being poured into this problem, and I'm hopeful that uh, that will lead to some practical solutions as well. Yeah, I think that sounds exciting. And um, you know, certainly no shortage of extremely bright people, yourselves included, working in this disease space. So, well, hey, I thank you for sharing your expertise, your thoughts, your opinions, being candid about how you think about these patients with um, aggressive disease. Any parting thoughts for the listenership before we call it a day? Send all your patients to medical oncology. I would just say try to stay engaged. The literature is, is moving quite a bit. There There is a long, long period of time earlier in my career when nothing was happening in bladder, but right now I'd say for bladder and upper tract right now, there's a lot of trials. Uh, it's hard to keep track, but definitely uh, keep an eye out for, for both new uh, trials coming out and new markers coming out. I think there's going to be a lot of advancements in the near future. All right. Well, Suzanne Yair, thank you. Thank you. I look forward to seeing you uh, sooner rather than later. And again, appreciate your time. Bye. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, DM us at underscore Backtable on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable is hosted by Aditya Bagrodia and Jose Silva. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon, with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross. And Ness Smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. With support from Devante Del Brune. Social media and PR by Chi Ding. Administrative support provided by Jimmy Lee Kennebrew. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.